You are listening to Keystone Stock Talk Podcast, episode 119. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week for your enjoyment, and show notes are found at www.keystocks.com. Come back often, and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or on iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Keystocks and on Facebook or via our 24-hour streaming radio station, pennystocks.fm. And keep submitting your stocks via the usual social channels or at our website, keystocks.com, for our Your Stock Our Take segment. And we just might review your stock in an upcoming show and let you know if it is a buy, sell, or hold. This week in our Your Stock, Our Take segment, we start by taking a listener question on one of the leading online groceries in Canada, Good Food, symbol F-O-O-D on the TSX. The stock is up 24% in the last five trading days and up approximately 200% since the start of the year. We let you know why and if there is further potential in the stock. Our second Your Stock, Our Take is on Northwest Healthcare Properties REIT, symbol NHW.UN, on the TSX, which holds 183 properties under management with a 97.3% occupancy rate. Its asset mix is around 55% hospitals and healthcare facilities and around 45% medical office buildings. The stock pays a strong 7% yield, and we let you know if it has growth potential. Our final Your Stock Arc take comes in from a listener in reference to a profitable Canadian microcap, Rewe Corp, symbol R-I-W-I. On the TSX Venture, Rewe is an intriguing global trend tracking and prediction technology firm with a solid balance sheet and a growth focus, uh, focusing on recurring its re- or increasing its recurring revenue base. A listener asks us if the company's shares remain an opportunity. So let's get into the show. We had a a busy week. I'd like to welcome uh, my co-host, Aaron and Brennan. How are you guys doing? Good. Good morning. Good, good. What's uh, what's the weather like out there in Saskatoon, Brennan? Oh, it's getting pretty chilly. I mean, I think it's plus 10 or something, so not too, too bad. Um, I ended up uh, putting, putting my Subaru, so my sports car, away last week. Uh, which was kind of sad, um, just because you know we're probably going to be getting snow uh, sometime in the beginning of October or through the through October at least. It's pretty typical, um, but yeah, not too not too bad. Is it? What about you guys? Is it uh, smoky in in Vancouver? No, no, still, no. Skies that... are blue and sun is nice. out, so so all is good. I think it's twenty one degrees or something right now. A Subaru sports car. Subaru is the responsible man sports car. That's that's a beautiful vehicle you got there. Yeah, I do enjoy it. Um, it's a nice way of putting it, Ryan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, but we, I would say it's a busy week. Uh, the, the Stanley Cup was just awarded last night in the bubble, so congrats to Tampa Bay. There was, There is tonight a U.S. election debate, uh, the first one. It should be interesting. Or basically like watching a car wreck, um, so I'm sure we'll be all tuning in to watch that. You can't look away. The funny um, thing is, I, I, I don't even think at this point it really matters. Um, most people, almost everybody, in my opinion, is already, yeah, they, they already know who they're going to vote for, if they're going to vote. Um, I think that Donald Trump, literally, no matter what he says or does, his support is is solid clad. Like, it's, it's not going to change. Um, he, I remember he said once he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and people would still like him, and, and it seems to be the case. Um, Biden, you know, obviously, uh, there's lots of Trumpers out there. You know, a lot of people vote for Biden. I don't think he has a movement behind him like Trump does. But So it'll be interesting to see if he can pick up some, some support. But it seems like this is the battle between the pro-Trumpers and the anti-Trumpers. Yeah. Yes, no, it should, it, like I said, I think it's going to be like watching a car wreck. We're not going to comment too much on it uh, or really position our portfolios that much differently either way. Um, like we've said many times before, uh, it, it, we just don't see a good practice to, uh, to try to position 
your portfolio on a prediction of a certain party getting in in power. You want to have good businesses that can uh, survive and thrive no matter what the current sitting government is because that can change and policies can change uh, sometimes in a heartbeat. And you may be positioned what you think is the right way at one point in a company that could benefit, but it can flip on you and then you're in a position, in a significantly negative position, just having good solid businesses that are in a position to benefit uh, in any in any with any sitting government is is a better situation than uh, trying to predict which way an election will go and bet on that type of uh, investment strategy. And now, that's the key um, point is that people. Yeah. I'll just say people ask us all the time, how does the election, all the time. whether it be yeah, Canada, the, the United States, how does it affect your investment strategy? And the answer is, it just it doesn't. I mean, there's really no way to predict what a political party or politician is going to do when they're in office or how other decisions they make are going to offset um, some positive things, some positive policies that they put forward. So it's just, it's, it's, there's too many moving parts of that equation to really make an investment strategy out of it. And when we're looking at our portfolios, we're planning for the next five, 10 years, not the next couple of years or, or the next six months. So I would say, um, regardless of who gets elected, you know, there's going to be a lot of drama. There's going to be volatility in the market. And that's actually something that we hope to be able to take advantage of uh, in the future. Yeah. And we do have a releasing a new special report this week for our Canadian small cap growth and U.S. growth and value clients uh, from a conference that we attended just at the start of this month, finished our completed our research, uh, have some mini reports in there, look at numbers on all 300 plus companies that were at that event. Plus, uh, it looks like we may have a new recommendation or two coming out from that uh, you know, it was a good conference overall, good companies did a lot of interviews, uh, watched a lot of video. Uh, it was, you know, it's a well attended event and, uh, you know, some decent companies there that we can find to, uh, you know, provide some new recommendations to our clients out of that. So finally, or, or sorry, first off, we're going to start off, uh, that would be a quick show, but we're going to start off with our um, our first company, and that is Air. Uh, it is not our weekly start to your stock, our take. It's time we answer a question on your stock in a little segment we like to call Your Stock, Our Take. Buy, sell, or hold. It's on uh, Good Food Market Corp, symbol F-O-O-D on the TSX. I think uh, this is Aaron's, right? Yes, it is. I actually thought Good Food was a weekly star. It, it certainly deserves to be with the stock up 24% over the last five days. But um, Good Food Market Corp. Symbol is food, F-O-O-D, on the TSX. It trades today for around $9. And it's just under a $600 million market cap company. So what does Good Food do? They are a leading online grocery company in Canada. The company delivers fresh meals and grocery products to customers so that they can enjoy delicious meals at home every week. The company commenced, commenced operations in 2014 and today reports 280,000 active subscribers. The stock price has had a tremendous run this year and over the past week. Good Food stock is up 24% over the last five trading days and up approximately 200% since the start of the year. I do have to admit, full disclosure, that I was once a paying customer of Good Foods. Overall, I thought the service was good. You get a package of partially prepared food and recipes that you can make throughout the week. The food was delicious. My main complaint was that the prep time for these recipes was significantly higher uh, than what was stated by the company. But overall, I thought the service was good. Uh, it just didn't work out well for my family of five, so I did discontinue it myself. But I would consider it trying. I would consider trying it again in the future. But enough about me. Let's talk about what's moving good food stock price and if this will continue. Unlike many food delivery services, Good Food has generated an, a good degree of financial success. The company's subscriber count continues to increase, which has led to strong revenue growth. In the company's last quarter, they also reported positive net income for the first time. They also stated that the COVID-19 pandemic had an overall positive effect on Good Foods business, acting as a catalyst in the shift to e-commerce grocery shopping. Let's take a look at recent financial performance. Good Food reported its fiscal Q3 results on July 8th. 
Total revenue for the quarter was up 74% to $86.6 million. Adjusted EBITDA was $6 million compared to a loss of $2.3 million last year. Net income was $2.7 million compared to a loss of $3.6 million. This is their first quarter of positive adjusted EBITDA and net income. Uh, operating cash flow for the quarter was $8.6 million compared to $2.3 million in the same quarter last year. Good Food announced on September 2nd that the active subscriber count had grown to 280,000, which is an increase of 40% year over year. When we look at evaluation on Good Food, we really have to evaluate it at this time based on revenues since the company only has one quarter of positive earnings. At the current price, Good Food is trading at a price of sales multiple of about 2.4 times. Overall, we are actually very impressed with Good Food and its performance. The story has been a big success so far. Subscriber counts and revenues continue to grow, and the company reported its first quarter of positive earnings and adjusted EBITDA. One thing to watch out for is a slowdown in growth as the company starts to saturate its market. Good Food already has 280,000 subscribers, and the Canadian and the Canadian market is relatively small. The company also has some established competitors who will be fighting for a bigger piece of that market, and new competitors are always entering into the fray. At some point soon, we would expect to see the growth rate slow. However, even with the slowdown in subscriber growth, the, stump, the company still has good runway to increase its subscriber count and should have the opportunity to focus on growing revenue and profit per customer. I don't have many negative things to say about good food. Fundamentally, the, the company looks strong and it's improving. The valuation of revenue is reasonable. It's not currently a recommendation of Keystone, but certainly something we can look at now that the company has started to produce profitable quarters. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, some of the things that we would monitor is obviously it has a pandemic related bump and perhaps that, you know, just getting in front of more consumers will contribute to changing behavioral patterns going forward, shifting from two meal delivery services versus traditional, just shopping for your food that uh, the traditional way. Uh, the slowdown in growth is a potential um, as, you know, if as we get through uh, COVID-19, get through a pandemic. It, Aaron said it's a very competitive market. Um, we have always looked at Good Food as a company that just is really going out there trying to grab subscribers, grab a, a large base. And potentially it would be a target for some U.S. businesses, uh, some larger U.S. businesses in this area long term that wanted to just basically jump into the Canadian market and, you know, jump on good food is a great way to do that. Uh, the valuation on a price to sales basis isn't bad. I mean, a price to earnings or EV to EBITDA, uh, it's coming down because of the last quarter, but it's still quite high overall, quite high. So uh, we continue to monitor it for sure. I mean, they're doing a good job relative to some other in the market, uh, growing at least with profitable EBITDA. Uh, which is a good thing, and it's something we like to see. And I, I will say as well that when it comes to a larger competitor, like say an Amazon wanting to get a better foothold in this business, um, some people would be concerned uh, that that added competition competition would wear into the company's market share. There is certainly, I mean, it's speculative potential. There is certainly potential that a larger player, as you said, could just come in and acquire good food down the road. But I mean, we have no. We're not making any any assessment there, but I mean, that's certainly... Is, that's definitely is one thing we don't future. do is just bet on a takeover target over the long term. Uh, it just, it can happen in two weeks or 10 years, or it can just not happen. You, you want to buy a business not based on the fact that it may be a takeover target. You want to buy it because it's a good underlying business trading at reasonable valuations with growth. We always stress that. It's just a bonus if the company gets taken out now. If you have those things, though, you know, if you have an attractive business trading at an attractive price, has a good balance sheet, uh, has growth outlook going forward, that makes it a takeover target. And that's why um, over the years we've had uh, not, you know, we've had 30 to 50, 30, 40, 50 companies taken over from particular Canadian small cap universe. Uh, we've had 30 companies, sorry, just in our from our Canadian uh, small cap cash rich report got taken over, get taken over uh, over the past eight years that have been profiled in there. It's because, again, I hearken back to this, get a good business, trading at a reasonable price that has a great balance sheet. There's other, there's smart money out there. They tend to come in 
and take a piece of that business and they might just buy the business outright. That's how you get an exit uh, in some of these companies. Don't buy for that. That's the bonus you get when you invest in businesses with that type of profile. So let's look at our second Your Stock, Our Take. It's time we answer a question on Your Stock in a little segment we like to call Your Stock, Our Take. Buy, sell, or hold. Uh, it is on Northwest, Northwest Healthcare Properties, REIT. Brennan, that is yours. Perfect. Thank you, Ryan. So yes, Northwest Healthcare Properties, REIT, NWH.UN on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Currently trading at a price of around $11.42, has a market cap of $1.95 billion and a yield of approximately 7%. So Northwest Healthcare Properties Real Estate Investment Trust is a Canadian open-ended trust with the strategic objectives to provide sustainable and growing cash distributions through investment in healthcare real estate in Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Canada, and Europe. And as at June 30th, 2020, the company had 183 properties under management with a 97.3% occupancy rate, and its asset mix is about 55% hospitals and healthcare facilities, and around 45% medical office buildings. So jumping right into the financials here, uh, this is for Q2 of 2020. Revenue was down around 1.2% to 90.2 million compared to the same period last year. Uh, adjusted funds from operations or AFFO was 35.6 million, an increase of around 17% from 30.4 million in Q2 of 2019. And AFFO per unit was approximately 26. 20 cents uh, per unit, up approximately 13% from 18 cents in Q2 of 2019. And of course, I always like looking a little longer term just to see the trajectory of the business and showing the progress of the company's financials over the past 36 months. So I'm comparing three separate uh, trailing 12 month periods here. Uh, we can see that AFFO per unit has remained relatively flat at around 82 uh, cents per unit over this whole time. So not much growth. Now, looking forward, the company has 11 development projects in the pipeline, with all of them expected to be completed between the end of 2020 uh, and 2023, and providing Northwest with an anticipated net operating income of 20.4 million. Now, because it is a REIT, uh, of course, the company is quite levered with over $2 billion in debt on its balance sheet and a net debt to EBITDA multiple of 8.5 times, which is pretty high, but I don't think that it is uh, overall concerning in this case uh, because uh, it does have an interest coverage multiple of around three times. And comparing the company's leverage to my analysis last week on Storage Vault, which of course is not a REIT, but has similar operations uh, to a REIT, Storage Vault came in with a net debt to EBITDA multiple of over 13 times. So you can just see here how Northwest would be favorable comparatively. Now, looking at the dividend, uh, it has remained the same for over 10 years at uh, around six and a half cents. And just relating back to what the company does here, um, the, the company said that it provides sustainable and growing cash distributions. Now, I would kind of disagree with this because these cash dis distributions have been around six and a half uh, cents over the past uh, 10 years. So they haven't really been been growing, uh, nonetheless. Um, but uh, looking at the payout ratio here, uh, they are paying out approximately 100% of AFFO over the past 12 months. Um, and you know, this is pretty high. It's pretty common for a REIT to have a high payout ratio like this. Um, but it would be nice to maybe see this slightly lower, uh, so they can support future growth uh, with their own cash flow rather than uh, dipping into some more debt. And uh, just a quick valuation assessment, they are trading around 33 times enterprise value to AFFO, uh, which could be viewed as trading near or above fair value, given its limited growth. Now our take here, to sum things up, Northwest Healthcare Properties growth has been limited and trades near or above fair value, all while maintaining a sustainable dividend payout ratio uh, and sustainable financial leverage on the balance sheet. 
Being in the healthcare segment with over 55% of its assets leased to hospitals and other healthcare facilities, leased under long-term inflation indexed lease structures, removing any operating costs or capex risk to the company, future income should be relatively stable. And I believe if you are looking for a decent place to store some of your capital and earn a nice yield, Northwest Healthcare could be an could be a good option now of course capital gains will uh, probably be limited just because of the uh, the growth that we've seen here and uh, just to add a disclaimer at the end here i just wanted to, to say that we do not have northwest uh, under coverage or as a recommendation um, but all in all i think that it is a relatively decent uh, real estate investment trust Right. So I've actually been looking at Northwest Healthcare for several years um, in the income research, and I, I get quite a few questions about it. And um, I, I mean, I would I would definitely support what you're saying in terms of the lack of growth. Um, so this is a company that has been very acquisitive in the past, lots of acquisitions. So we've seen the revenue, we've seen the net operating income increase, um, but we haven't seen the cash flow per share really increase over the period that I've been looking at it. Um, just looking at the payout ratio here, I think it says about 100% of AFFO, which is somewhat of a proxy for, for free cash flow, 87% um, normalized. So I, I don't know exactly how they normalize it, but 100%, I, I would definitely say that's risky. Generally speaking, we like to see the payout ratios of REITs um, you know, in the 80s or under 85%. Once you start getting over 90%, uh, there really isn't a lot of flexibility there for the company. Um, and uh, as well as you said, Brendan, they have not been growing their their income distributions. So it's um, for me, I, I think it's 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 not a bad company. I do think that there are better REITs to own. Awesome, no, and I, I appreciate that. You know, I'm a I'm a junior analyst. I'm learning, and uh, you know, I was wondering if you know 100% uh, payout ratio is a little too high. Uh, you know, if I saw just a normal company that wasn't a REIT paying out that. Uh, it's of course way too high and unsustainable um, but you know okay so that's uh, good to know you know around 80 to 90 uh, percent would be a lot better and of course yeah if there is growth um, so you know with, with this company attractive yield but uh, but yeah just no growth and yeah I mean the, the normalized rate is getting closer to that but still the the units basically trade slightly above where they did 10 years ago uh, and they're not growing their income distributions I mean that for me that's Probably and one of the you'd reasons also really why. You really want to dig in to know mm. how are they normalizing that, right? Like, mm -hmm. what are they? What adjustments are they making to um, to normalize? Yeah, that that's always a very important thing. I mean, it's 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 a lot of times companies will report earnings per share. They'll report adjusted earnings per share, and, and adjusted earnings per share may or may not be um, a better representation of the economic value being created or the financial performance. So, um, it. Probably something that we'd need to d dig a little deeper in on. But as I said, in my opinion, I think that there's better REITs out there to own in the Canadian market right now. Yeah, and what, what Aaron's really saying is sometimes we agree with their adjustments, other times we disagree, really. So you have to look at those individually to see whether or not it makes sense from our valuation perspective. So finally, we're going to look at a Your Stock, Our Take. It's time we answer a question on Your Stock. In a little segment we like to call Your Stock, Our Take. Buy, sell, or hold. On is on Rewe Corp, symbol R-I-W-I -I on the TSX Venture. It currently trades around $3.55 with about a $63 million market cap. What does the company do? They are a global trend tracking and prediction technology firm. They have a patented cloud-based software solution which provides a global digital intelligence platform to clients seeking real-time consumer and set citizen sentiment data anywhere in the world in order to improve business performance, evaluate program effectiveness, enhance customer engagement, and to monitor and reduce emerging threats and violent conflict worldwide. Let's look at the financial performance of the company. For the first six months of this year, 2020, it had revenues of $2.32 million. That's an increase of 53% from $1.5 million last year. Net income was up over 600% to around $0.3.4 cents per share uh, from basically nil, just uh, slightly above uh, half a cent per share in this same period last year. Uh, the balance sheet. Rewe has a solid net cash balance for a business its size. The company ended the quarter with about $3.7 uh, in cash and virtually no debt. 
Now, while the growth in revenue is in strong, Riwi remains a small company with a revenue base of approximately $4 million on a trailing 12-month basis. The company has a PE on a trailing basis of 33 approximately, a price to EBITDA of 36 and an adjusted price to EBITDA of around 334 Now, on each of these multiples, Riwi trades at a significant premium to the market. We like the business, the balance sheet, and the growth prospects, but the valuations uh, appear to be capture, captured in the current share price. Now, management's goal is to push annual revenues from the current $4 million range to $30 million by 2024. If it re- achieved with a growing recurring revenue base, Riwi has upside. Again, we think the management team's responsible, profitable growth, solid balance sheet approach is good, but the premium valuations here on the stock at this time just have us mo- monitoring at present as the company is still really a micro cap based on its uh, current revenue run rate. And that's what we're seeing a lot these days when it comes to small cap successful companies, um, you know, particularly anything in the uh, related to the software space is, is valuations are high. I mean, if there's any level of profitability, um, decent revenue growth, we're, we're, we're seeing the risk being in the valuation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we're seeing that. So let's say, you know, it's a good company. It'll be it is in our and has been in our Canadian uh, small cap cash rich report for a couple years because it has that quality balance sheet, uh, not a lot of no debt really here. And it has been profitable. So it's a company we continue to monitor really trading at premium valuations right now. As an aside, this company actually uh, ahead of the last election in the U.S., Uh, had some data that indicated uh, a Trump win. So perhaps monitoring this company, uh, what they're talking about in terms of the current upcoming election, if they have some data coming in, uh, would be a good place to look because uh, it has been a good predictive tool. Some of its software has been a good predictive tool. So, you know, it's interesting software to monitor, see if they can keep upping that recurring base over time. Again, a small revenue base still at this point. So we monitor it. I think that's going to close off our show this week. We'd like to thank all of our listeners. Thank you for sending in your questions to our Your Stock, Our Take segments and to our Ask Us Anything segments. Uh, We'd like to thank, again, all our listeners. Stay safe out there, and I wish you profitable investing. Profitable investing. Thanks, everyone.